Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away, pumps it in, 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big Three NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Big Three NBA podcast. Uh, here's Rod Blakely. I'm with Gary Washburn. Uh, Kwani Luna still on the on the inactive list. Uh, yo, Gary, I'm, I'm going to have to start calling her uh, Kwani Kwani Leonard. We, man, <laughs> we should be back. Start calling her Joel and B. Exactly, <laughs> Kwani and B. Yeah, <laughs> back. Man, it's been a minute. It's been a yeah. minute. Uh, but the train got to keep moving. Train got to keep moving because that's what we do. Uh, and and this, the same thing applies to the Celtics. I mean, they had that, you know, really, I think, let's be honest and call it what it is. It was a bad loss to the Hawks. Uh, a Trey Youngless Hawks team. Uh, but they bounced back with a good win over Brooklyn. They sit at 10 and 3, second best record in the East uh, to Cleveland. Uh, a big part of what they do, Gary, and, and you know this as well as anyone, is that three ball. They love the three ball. Uh, averaging more than 50 three-point attempts a game. Uh, are, how comfortable are you with them in that number, Gary? I mean, 53 is – damn. That's, I mean, how comfortable are you with them being able to win over the long haul shooting that many threes? I think it depends on the quality of the three, whether they're hunting them down or whether they're, whether they're in the flow of the game and who's taking those threes. Um I don't mind if it's in the flow of the game. What I mind is when they start hunting them and then they give up uh, opportunities to score at the rim. They give up opportunities to get twos uh, for the sake of trying to hit the home run ball. And that's what I think uh, sometimes uh, is their issue. But I think that the better their offense has gotten over the last couple of years, the better and more higher quality threes that they're taking. And um, in my opinion, uh, I'm not, you know, stomping my feet like this is terrible, but I want them to take the most quality shots. If those shots are threes, uh, but there's times like the other game against um, Brooklyn when Hauser was, I think, 0 for 9, 1 for 9, and he kept taking them down. He's a high-quality shooter, and he hit that 10th one, uh, and, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a critical play, but I just think sometimes – uh, you might want to attack the basket. You might want to get to the free throw line. Um, so that's the only problem I have. If if you're going to be a three-point shooting team, you can't have it give it up for the sake of being soft in the middle um, and not get, not rebounding, uh, things like that. So to me, I'm not, you know, angry with their three-point philosophy, um, but I do think they've got to mix it up a little bit more. Um, and I think that they have two elite two-point shooters in Tatum and Brown. Um, and it, it would not hurt every now and then to throw the ball into Cade and to throw the ball into Cornette and get an easy two or an alley-oop. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it just seems that there's a lot of heat checking when you ain't got no smoke going with these guys. Uh, just taking threes that you do usually see taken after you've made a couple. Uh, but they, they they seem to take – it feels like there's a lot more of the you don't really need to take this three, do you, kind of shots from these guys as opposed to ones that seem to come about in the flow of the offense. Uh, but to your point, Gary, the thing that jumps out to me, and then you, you really – I think you nailed it on the head, is that all this three-point shot taking has kind of made them a little soft in the middle. And I get it that you don't have Porzingis. And I, I get it that Al Horford ain't that same guy that he was three, four, five years ago. But, damn, I mean, it's – it's I mean, teams are looking like they're they punking him by, by taking away the middle. And without even trying hard to take it away. Totally. I mean, I felt like the Atlanta game was – first of all, I thought Joe got out coached. Okay, because Quinn Snyder was like, the only chance we have to win is to make an ugly game and then uh, make it a game where the paint. So Clint Capella started eating. Then a, a, I always mispronounce his name. A Quandu. Uh, um, a Quandu. Uh, yeah, I know you talk about. Quandu. I always mispronounce his name. No disrespect. I, I always butcher. There's certain names in the league, and that's one of them that I have trouble with. But um, he was just feasted in the paint. 
They got mismatches. And then Dyson Daniels. And I, and I just think the one play that I wrote about this is when Keaton Wallace, like it was uh, 117, I think it was like uh, 117, or sorry, sorry, it might have been 116, 113. And it landed, 40 seconds left, Atlanta needed a bucket. And he just drove into the paint and like kept going and was like, is somebody going to defend me? And then they didn't. He just flipped it up and in. And I'm like, where's the rim protection? He he literally looked stunned that nobody challenged him at the rim. And then it was, you know, obviously the Celtics didn't score again. And Aquandu got the uh, sorry got the tip for the winner. But to me, that was disturbing. And I think that, like you like you said, they 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 got to get tougher in the paint. And I don't know whether it's I don't know if Porzingis makes things different. Whether you started playing Xavier Tillman a little bit more to lay some hat, you got to prevent guys like Dyson Daniels from just slicing into the paint or going to the rim. And so they've got to send a message in that way. Um, so I have no problem with the threes, but you can't you can't just be a finesse team. And Atlanta was fit, more physical. The Celtics were really sloppy with the ball. And Atlanta was like, the only way we have the chance to win is to punk you guys. And in the end, that's what they did. Yeah, and I, I think we're starting to see that's the strategy that teams are taking with the Celtics, that we can't outshoot them, we can't out-athletic them, but we damn sure can put put a, you know, put a hat on them and make them pay. I go back to the, you know, the Indiana game. Uh, you know, earlier this year where it, the Pacers that were just a physically punishing team. Uh, you look at what Atlanta did. They were the more physically punishing team. And I, I just wonder, though, Gary, I mean, when, when I'm watching the Celtics play uh, at the beginning of the season, you know, I, I looked at them and I saw them being very different than the defending champions that I've seen in the past. But now they look damn, they look a lot like defending champions of the past from the standpoint of, yeah, we the champs. We know what this role looks like, and we know that we can get there and be the last team standing. But the difference between the great teams is that they don't play like that. They know that. They just don't play that way. The Celtics are playing as if they know that we don't really need to be super physical now. We don't need to, to do all those little things now because we're going to be one of the best teams at the end of the day. And the way the East is just basically looking like looking like Survivor out here where only Cleveland and Boston are the only teams that are eating well while everyone else is just eating scraps. They're not being pressed record-wise to clean up a lot of the stuff because they're right there with, with Cleveland. How concerning are you that that the Celtics, you know, they may be kind of reverting back to some bad habits, the kind of habits that a lot of NBA championship teams have that year after? Yeah, the slow starts are a concern, 16-2 to Brooklyn, 16-2 to Milwaukee. And I think they kind of have this attitude like we can come back on y'all, and they can miss many nights, you know, and we can hit the three and we're going to out-three you, but they're going to have to out-defend, out-rebound, and out-tough teams. And – that's what I, I think that they're trying to get back. I think they've lost that a little bit. And I don't know what you do when you don't have, like Al Horford, like you said, was playing limited minutes this year. He's not an enforcer like that. Um, Kata is out there, and he's doing some good things. He's also making some mistakes, and he can get in foul trouble. He's your only real enforcer out there. And then because they've stopped playing Xavier Tillman, that the first six minutes of that Brooklyn game where he missed all – you got – you know, because teams, understandably, are going to leave him open. Like, no, Xavier, we don't trust you as a three-point shooter. You might hit one occasionally. He hit a big one during that game um, three against the Mavericks in the finals in that corner in front of the Mavericks bench. Mm -hmm. But teams are going to look at him and go, hey, oh, shoot that, shoot that. Uh, and he's got to either, A, start making them, B, he's not going to play because he's not stretching the floor. Or C, Joe can put him in there to be kind of an enforcer, a guy to lay a little bit of hat, give some hard fouls, make sure teams are just not slicing into the paint and laying it in and, and doing that pretty stuff. Like, I just thought, you know, like Dyson Daniels just caused so much havoc in that game. And that's like I saw him play in Atlanta, and I tweeted out, like, wow, like I, I saw him play for Team Australia in the Olympics, okay? He – He's always been a good defender. He was a – last year in New Orleans, he was a kind of a, a deer in headlights. He wasn't ready. But Atlanta's kind of unleashed him where offensively he's become a force, not a force like a superstar, but a guy who can get you 16, 18 points. It's like, whoa, 
who is this guy? Then he's a menace on defense. And then when he pulled up and hit that that elbow three in front of the Celtics bench, I was like, with confidence. He had, he was 0 for 4 before then. When he hit that, I was like, wow, this is a different player. And I just think the Celtics have to understand, and I think they do, that they're everybody's Super Bowl, right? They're everybody's Super Bowl. Um, the Warriors played really well against them. But they're, they're also, in all honesty, they lost to – in overtime to Indiana, they lost by six to the Warriors in a game that they probably they kind of let go, and they lost by one to Atlanta. So we're not talking about losing sometimes when they don't play well. They can play average and win. They played average. They played, what, two and a half good quarters against Milwaukee and yeah. one. Yeah, made, made the second half of the um, quarter – in the second quarter, but they they only could, they cut like a seventeen point lead to eleven, so you can count that. And then the second half, like, and they were able to beat the Bucks. So um, to me, we're not talking about oh well, they're ten and three. Yep, they're ten and three, second best record in the East, one of the best records in the NBA. Like I think probably fifth or sixth. I think Oklahoma City's got two losses, and a couple other teams just have two losses behind Cleveland. But to me. There's, they are good enough to play well and to play poorly and win. Um, yeah, they have what here, what the fourth best record in the league behind Cleveland, Oklahoma City, and Golden State. So, um, to me, they've got to address that toughness issue, the rebounding issue, even up the points in the paint, and figure out how to get more paint touches offensively to get out there and get those open threes. I don't have a problem. If they're taking threes with those clean looks with their elite shooters, with his Peyton, but sometimes Peyton's getting to the point now where he's hunting them. Mm. Uh, you know, we want to, if you're the Celtics, you want to chill on, on the hunting and Peyton, because I think Peyton's getting caught up in, oh, here's Peyton. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> it's about to be a three, three fest. He's feeling himself. He's yeah. feeling himself. <laughs> he's just throw, throwing them up like Papa Shot. And it's like, Peyton, pass the ball. Get a good positioning, set your feet as opposed to like I think he's hunting a little bit too much. Sometimes Derek is hunting a little bit too much, um, and obviously we all know Drew. Drew will take a pull up three off the break. I mean, and then Jason, interesting game from Jason against Brooklyn. Only took six threes, but hit five of them. Right, attacked the rim, didn't take thirteen or fourteen threes. He took six. Like. I think he needs to be a little bit more selective in the three-point line. Um, but I like the way he played against Brooklyn and because I think he was a little bit off against Atlanta. But to me, um, I think they got little things to tie up, toughness, rebounding, points in the paint, maybe a little bit better selection of three-point shots. But I think they're I think they're okay. I mean, Jason's at 38%. Jalen from three. A little bit of a concern, less under 30% at 29.5. Hauser at 32.8. But Hauser started slow last year, if you guys remember. He started slow last year. So that might be just kind of Hauser being a slow starter. Um, if I recall, he had a real slump for about six weeks. Uh, it might not have been a start, but it was early. And it might have been like mid-November to January, then he picked it up. Um, but other than that, uh, you know they're they're hitting thirty seven percent as a team. You can't. That's a very good percentage. Um, I think they're okay. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action with over ten million members and billions of dollars in awarded winnings. Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to one hundred times your cash. Run your game all season long on Prize Picks. And do so with as little as four correct picks, picks that can get you up to 100 times your money. Prize Picks invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks doesn't hit. Sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks is the best way to win real money this basketball season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your picks in less than 60 seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money 
all season long on prize picks. Just download the app today and use code CLNS to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Download the app today and use the code CLNS to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks, run your game. I'm still a little bit concerned about that center position. And I know things in theory are going to change when Porzingis gets back. But, you know, I'm looking at Kata, I'm looking at Luke, and, and you know, we're, we're looking at Tillman doing what we do, which is watch a lot of the game. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not feeling that great about these guys kind of holding a fort to Brzezinski's back because the one thing that when you look at the teams that have beaten them have, have done is they've been the more physical team. And Kata, you know, he, he's got he's got physicality in his DNA, but he's still learning how to be a regular rotation guy, let alone a freaking starter. And, yeah. you know, Luke, you know, he's had some injuries, that a few more injuries and bumps and bruises than he, we're used to him having. And so you've got the situation where, you know, they have a – they went into the season with question marks at the center position and we're, you know, we're, we're a dozen plus games into this thing and there's still question marks about their ability to man that position. And if just Garrett, from your perspective, I mean, how big a deal is it the, the struggles that they've had at that, that particular position on the floor? Well, so I think they can survive, especially when they get Porzingis back. But I think what we're learning is like Horford, you know, is, going to be useful but they're going to it's going to be a particular now he's playing about 27 minutes a game that's not bad 8.6 points 5.5 re- Horford's not has not been bad um you know and he's shooting 44 percent from three Horford's giving you what you need but you also have 22 other minutes in an NBA game and you also have games that Horford does not play because he's played in, in 11 of 13 games because of rest because of the back-to-back situation so you're going to need Kata and you're going to need Cornette to step up. Kata, I thought, had a really good stretch. The game's in Charlotte. I thought he was good. I think he, he's learning. Um, he had a good game, the game in Atlanta. You know, after a little uh, slow start, he was he was good in Atlanta. Um, but like you said, Sherrod, he's 25 years old. There's going to be a level of consistency. He, he This is his first real long-term, long NBA stretch here. I mean, this is a guy who's kind of been in the – he was in the Sacramento system. Listen, I mean, look, look, let's look at his numbers. He played 15 games as a rookie, yeah. five in the second year of Sacramento, and 28 last year. Okay, he's already at 12 games, and he's probably played more minutes this year than he did almost in his previous three years. He played 48 NBA games before this year. So that's that's barely – just over a half a season. So you're asking him, hey, man, go in there and, uh, you know, give us 25 strong ones, you know, give us give us 10 boards, get a couple of blocks and and don't make any defensive errors. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to happen. He is going to be he is going to have to have situations where he is going to struggle. He's going to struggle on defense. He's going to struggle on offense. As I as I wrote, uh, you know, he doesn't have the greatest hands. I think there was a. A couple of games in Charlotte and Atlanta where they were trying to whip him the ball in the paint because they saw him open, and it's like you got to kind of feed him methodically. You can't just fire it in there to Kata because Kata doesn't have the greatest hands. And you know, I'm sure once he gets more, um, you know, reps, his his hands uh, will be better. But he doesn't have great hands right now, so you got to feed him the ball slowly. So you can't maybe use them as a weapon like you did, uh, like you like you'd like to. So uh, for me, I think he's he's just it's going to take time. Cornette's going to be Cornette as we know. I think he is who he is. He's going to make a block here and there. He's going to get scored the rim here and there, set a screen. Um, that's as about as best as you can expect. So if I'm uh, the, the the Celtics, you know, you sign Tillman to kind of be an enforcer. I think I would use him, but you cannot expect Tillman to be shooting threes. Like, like can we can we scrap that right now? Like, can we scrap Tillman at the three-point line? You know, I just think everybody can't do everything. I think we all know that, Shirai. We've all seen bigs in this, in this league try to become three-point shooters. I, mean, I remember uh, 
seeing my man Brandon Bass was trying to, you know, Brandon Bass was the perfect. PDB. Yeah, I love Brandon. The consummate mid-range shooter. And he He's was so good at it too. And he, it. Kind of, he was kind of getting pushed out the league. And so he decided he was gonna try shooting threes. And it just and with his style, it just didn't work. Right. Yeah. And he doesn't need to. He didn't need to. So, you know, Tillman, um, in his Boston career so far is eleven for forty two from the three point line. Okay, like we that's that's okay that that's <laughs> that's not good. No. That's okay. That's about 26%. So can we stop the Tillman for three thing? Unless he just proves that he can knock him down from that, gets him in one spot. But I, I think this year he has struggled 26%, um, 26% from the uh, field, 21% from the three-point line. But if you put him in positions to succeed, and Joe is good at doing that, Make him an enforcer. Make him lay some hat in the middle. Hey, give some hard fouls. I think you'll get get squeeze something out of um, Tillman as opposed to just relying strictly on Kata and if you you know maybe Cornet. And I said Al, I think is fine, but Al's years as a center, I think are over. I think he's a four. He's a stretch four. He's a guy like they're not putting him on centers defensively. You know. You know, he, he was guard, he was not guarding Nick Richards in Charlotte. Like they're putting him on fours, so mm-hmm. three or four. So to me, um, I think you're just gonna have. To, it, it might be time for a little bit more Tillman, but not from the three point line. Mm, interesting, interesting. Because they, they, they there's a clear and undeniable need for them to be a more physical team. Uh, and Tillman, when you look at that bench, uh, as far as physically imposing, is, is one of, if not the best option they have. Uh, it, it's it's interesting that, Gary, we're, we're, I remember there were pockets last season where there were questions about just the Celtics and their toughness, their physical toughness and, and things of that nature, and it feels like that discourse is back. And there are some receipts to, to go with the questions about their, their physical toughness. Uh, is it simply just a matter of just putting body on body, or are, are there other things they can do to just be a more uh, impactful team from a physicality standpoint? Well, I think the other guys also have to be physical. Jason, Jalen, I think they don't have a problem with that. They also have to rebound. Like, you can't let a team get 20 offensive rebounds. It's unacceptable. That's terrible, right? Terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I love I love uh, rebound. I love the Celtics, but that was terrible. Like to me, you can't have that happen. Now, I'm not saying it was a one-time thing. I'm not saying, but you know, and they they only allowed I want to say six against Brooklyn the next night. But Brooklyn wasn't really throwing the size. Claxton was kind of the the only big. But Brooklyn was kind of playing out five out two at times. Um, and but Atlanta put them two horses in the paint with Capella and Aquandu, and then said, "What you gonna do?" Right, and then even had the kid. Uh, how do you pronounce the number one overall pick? Rosacea. I'm killing. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just let you. I'm gonna let you marry. No, no, don't don't do that, man. Get help me out here. Help, help a brother out. Young fella. Yeah, young fella. Uh, he was. I mean, he got boards. Jalen Jalen Johnson got ten boards. So when your swing man and your your wings. Are rebounding it makes you a much better ball club and to me um those guys the jasons and jalen's have got to step up because you don't have you don't have andre drummond out there you don't have a dude gobbling up 15 16 boards like kata can do it here and there cornet's not a volume rebounder neither is horford we'll see what happens with when, when porzingis comes back but they're going to need a, it's going to be a team situation drew Derek. Get in there and get your nose dirty and get them boards. Quit worrying about getting the ball um, back down the floor and, stre- and and running the ball. Get the rebound first, and then you can go out on offense because I think too many times guys are ready to run, and then here comes an offensive rebound or one guy says, oh, I'm just going to run right up here and get the tip, or um, I-, I can an- anticipate the ball better and, and-, and gets the rebound. I mean, I just remember the the play against Atlanta. I want to say where um, it might have been Larry Nance is getting an offensive rebound, and then him getting the ball back out in the corner and hitting the three. 
I mean, I hadn't looked at Larry Nance's numbers. Yo, he only was on his fourth made three, right? No, no, no. Larry Nance from the three-point line entering that game was nine for 13. And this fool went five for six. So this fool was 14 for 19 for the three-point line this season. Like, <laughs> Steph was like, damn, dude, you're a good three-point shooter. Like, that's crazy. And I'm not saying it's not, it's a low, li- limited attempts. Okay, Still. I'm not calling him Steph. I ain't calling him Reggie Miller, Ray Allen. <laughs> you know, I ain't calling him none of them dudes. But that's crazy. Larry Nance, known for dunking on, like, dunking on Brooke Lopez and known for his ups. It's right. turning up. So that just shows you how this league is changing and how it's changed. But to me, the Celtics have to be tougher. It's got to be a collective team effort because you don't have that enforcer in the paint. And many teams don't have that guy. This is not the 90s. This is not the 2000s where you had, you know, you had Anthony Mason and you had Rashid, your boy Rashid Wallace. You had you had dudes in there that were just like like you, you had Kenyon or you know, Kenyon Martin, yeah, dudes in there that were just that was ready to, that was ready to throw hands. You don't have that anymore. You know? So that's the way the league has changed. That's fine. But you've got to do or our, our friend Steven Jackson. I love him. Give Captain Jack a, a shout out. Uh, you know, you didn't have them dudes that was just like, What's up? You know, like I'm it's my ball, or you're not laying this up, no layups, you know. So for me. I think they're going to have to do it collectively. It's not going to be a one-man effort. Yeah, and when you talk about collective, uh, more than one-man type efforts, uh, you you look at the Celtics team, and they've got I mean, easily uh, one of, if not the best starting five when they've got all their guys healthy. They showed that last season, and the fact that the band is back together, you know, obviously they're still among the top groups but their bench uh has has been interesting this year jason tatum after a recent game talked about the celtics bench is the best in the league uh you've seen a lot of teams play as i as have i would you consider them the best bench in the nba uh i think they're pretty they're pretty close i mean i think the team they saw earlier golden state's got to be up there Mm -hmm. with all the guys they throw out there because steve steve Kerr is doing what he didn't do in the Olympics, and that's playing more than more than nine guys. You know, <laughs> suddenly Steve is hip to like using all of his talent. But um, Golden State, but I, I think, I think yeah, like they got one because all of them. We talked about this earlier. Have taken steps forward. Peyton Pritchard taking a huge step forward. Stan Hauser off to a slow start, but is going to knock down the threes. Um, we're looking at. Um, Luke Cornett and Anemius Kata both have taken steps forward. Kata has been much more of an impact than I think any of us thought mm-hmm. beginning this year. I think people thought he's going to be the number three center. And now, okay, that's fine. No, he's got some starts. He's playing major minutes at times. So I think it, I think that they, they have a solid bench. I don't think they have. I don't know if it's a top bench in the league. But I do think that they have a lot of guys out there that can get some things done. Jordan Walsh has taken a step forward. He's not scoring a whole bunch, but he's playing a role, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, ask me at the end of the year, it might be that uh, Hauser starts knocking down more shots. Walsh is a, more, a bigger contributor, you know, uh, and, and he's comfortable with his minutes. Peyton Pritchard is continues his sixth man of the year Um Role because he's averaging 16 points a game. I mean, that's pretty impressive for uh, a guy coming off the bench, you know. Um, and we'll see what happens when Porzingis returns and who goes to the bench. That makes the bench even stronger there. So I think there's a lot of uh, reasons to like this bench. I don't think they're the best bench in the league, but I think I'll give them top five, right? Summertime is winding down, but the college football season will be in full swing before you know it. There's no better way to get your college football fix than Game Time, which is where you can find the best deals on college football game tickets, concerts, NFL, WNBA, and so much more. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff, so show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. The one college football game I'm looking forward to seeing this year is when my alma mater, Syracuse University, comes to my neck of the woods 
and takes on the Boston College Eagles. There's a great selection of seats starting as low as, get this folks, $3. That's right. $3 can get you in the building. Having the map of the stadium along with the different color-coded prices makes it super easy to find the best seats for your budget and not have to scramble all over the place on your app to do so. And you're covered by GameTime's lowest price guarantee where GameTime will credit you 110% of the difference. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. I will put them borderline top five. Uh, but but I, I think, Gary, I think we've seen two teams, at least one team and maybe a second, whose second unit is, I think, up to this point in the season, has just been better. And that Golden State, uh, they, they're sec- they play damn near anyone that's getting a check, basically, on their roster. I mean, they that's how – impactful that their second unit has been and that's it's frankly it's kept those starters for the most part honest i mean just because you start don't mean you're gonna go out there and play 30 35 minutes uh they got they got seven miles on that coming off that bench that want to play too and steve kerr i give him credit he's figured out that i'm not going to be able to beat teams the way i've done it in the past We're, it's going to have to be by committee we're going to have to get lots of different players to step up and contribute and, and frankly position them to win games and that's what they've been able to do so far this year they got one of the best overall records in uh the nba uh they've been tremendous contributions with lots of different players and that second unit has been among the best scoring second units in the nba this season in large part because they they play more than most second units do as far as personnel so you you have a situation where the celtics while they might be getting good play from their second unit i don't think they've been they haven't elevated to the point where you look at them and think like, damn, they got him and him and him off the bench. To your point, Gary, Porzingis is the game changer. He becomes that one big presence that bolsters everything about this team. Your starting five gets better. Your second unit gets better. Play calls by the damn coaches get better because you got a, another guy that's a major mismatch for the opponent out there that you can exploit on a game in game out basis. Uh, they just got to find a way to hold down the fort until you know Porzingis is is getting back, which you know we we've heard everything from you know sometime next month uh, might be the start of the the, the uh, 2025 calendar year, uh, but they've got to figure out ways for guys to be impactful until he gets back. Uh, and in that second unit, they, they've done they've done a solid job. But I would still say Golden State's second unit has been better. Yeah. Um, and so. I look at Sherrod, I'm looking at the leagues. Uh, okay, the Celtics are 24th in the NBA in bench scoring. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't mean that they have a bad bench. It means that they're probably not getting as many overall minutes right. uh, as some of the other benches. Because if you look at the top, like the top 10 scoring benches in the NBA, we see one, two, three, four, the, only four of those teams have winning records. So Golden State, Memphis, which are one, two, uh, Cleveland, 13 and 0, they're fifth in bench scoring. And then finally, Orlando's ninth, and they're seven and six. The rest of the teams, Utah, San Antonio, Portland, Charlotte, and Indi- Washington and Indiana, are all teams who are either you know losing or at 500. So that means to me, when you look at bench scoring and bench production, a lot of those bad teams are playing all their guys because their starters aren't very good. The Celtics have probably the best starting five in the league, so that means more minutes for them and less minutes for the bench. However, I do think that they still have one of the top benches in the league, although Golden State is blowing anybody out of the water. They're averaging 58 points a game from their bench, which is crazy. Uh, 46% from the field, you know, that's to me, that's impressive. Um, but if you look at the, if I'm looking at the percentage, you know, the shooting percentage, sorry, field goal percentage, mm-hmm. you know, the Celtics are still from their bench. Oh boy. Golden State is up there. 22nd. And, and Atlanta, so, too. Yeah. Atlanta's the number one because they're putting in. Your boy Quan do, and that dude scores at the rim. They're putting in bigs, and them bigs score at the rim. So there's a reason for everything. But to me, um, just because they're 24th does not make them less. It just means they're not playing as many minutes because you got a great starting five. So 
Um, to me, they still have a quality, very quality bench. I'm going to say go to state. And I, you know, Memphis, probably so too. I mean, you know, but they've had to play a lot of those guys because they've had so many injuries. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Uh, we, we're, we're nearing the end of this, but before we get out of here, let's go around the league real quick. And we're just going to call this uh, the big man segment. Uh, we're going to start with your boy, your boy, Joel Embiid, who sort of returned to the court. Sort of. Uh, man, $50 million don't get you what it used to, huh, G? No, I don't. <laughs> It's that, it's that inflation, man. <laughs> Damn, man. See, they, they, inflation is a man. <laughs> fifty don't take you as long as it as long as it used to. That used to last you a minute. Now, man, no. fifty million looking more like fifty cent right now. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> Damn. What? What? I mean, makes sense to, of this to me, Gary? Because I, I, I can't. I don't get it. Makes sense of what the hell is going on with Joel? I think it's probably a situation where. He really wanted to play the Olympics, and I think he was probably somewhat healthy there. He did, and then he probably took took time, shut it down in those critical months after the Olympics, mid-August, all the way to probably mid-early October, and came into camp and was like probably out of shape and was not ready. And, uh, you know, and I think that Philadelphia, knowing how important he is to the fran- – he's essential to the franchise – just signed with a three-year, $180 million extension, um, if I'm not mistaken. I just think they're like, we've got to do what, whatever it is to get him back on the floor. And if that means he misses the first 10 games or nine games, you know, like that's what we're going to have to do because forcing him out there, what, what you going to do? Push him out there, then he really looks bad and he really gets hurt because the one thing you don't want is him tearing up one of those knees and having him have to have a year off and at age 30, he'll be, I think he's just turned 30. Him and Giannis are around the same age. Uh, you know, 30 year old big man with a bad, with a torn ACL or MCL or patella tendon ain't a good look. And that's career threatening. So I think you got to kind of, you got to bow down. You got to do whatever it takes to get him back on the floor. It's handled poorly. He should probably have not played in the Olympics if he was not healthy. Um, I think the unfortunate part is about Joel Embiid is my opinion of him is that he's a top 75 player. I don't, I have not seen many bigs in the history of the NBA with his damn skill set. His ability to shoot the free throws, shoot the three, shoot for the mid range, his touch. He is a, such a gifted player. I mean, God, dog, just seeing him over the last seven, eight years now, being in Boston, you've seen him. Like when that dude's on, when he's right, he's so right. He's one of the top. To me, you know, top five centers of all time, like five to seven centers when he's right. I'm not talking about overall when he's right. You know, you put the Chamberlain and the Jabbar and the Russells and the Elijah Wands, and you know, you want to throw Ewing in there. Tim, like, if you care, you know, some people consider Tim Duncan, like, you could throw him in there, but Joel is in that conversation, top five, top 10 with his skill set, but he's just blowing it. You know, you throw Shaq in there too. He's blowing it because, and it kind of reminds me of Shaq, although Shaq was more later in his career, lack of conditioning, right? Like, and, and at 30, Shaq was winning championships and still in his prime with the Lakers at 30, and beats breaking down. Mm. And, you know, 30 is not promised. You, everybody ain't LeBron. Everybody ain't going to play till 40. Like, your career is on the line. Like, you might not be playing at 36. How many bigs besides our friend Robert Parrish played 36, 37? Like, you don't get the – centers don't get that. All that pounding on your knees, your hips, two, 289, 300 pounds, body pounding, that's not going to last. He is not, you know, he is not Vince Carter where you, you're always in immaculate shape. Like, so he's, it, it's sad that that's going to be his legacy is not playing as much as he should. Because when he's right, when I see him, like, that dude scares teams. When he's on, he gets to the free throw line. He's got the great touch. Like it's not like like Shaq. Shaq didn't have no mid range game. Shaq, yeah. didn't, you know what I'm saying? Shaq didn't have that. Shaq was whoop whoop dunk. However, you know, like Embiid had has all the tools, all the tools in his tool bag. It just don't either don't want it. Can't get in elite shape. 
you know, it's 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 sad because I think we all want to see him healthy three or four more years. Okay, now you're 35, 36, it might be time to retire, but you're 30. You still got time left. But that's not promise. We we all remember our friend T Mac. T Mac at 30 was about done. Like his body said, I ain't got no more left. There's a lot of guys out there. Your friend, I, I mean, and he got in, he got he got in trouble, he got out the league because he was acting a fool. But Deion Waiters talking about he could still drop 20 on teams. Is Deion Waiters 30 years old? I looked this up, like probably just turned. Just and turned. He's out the so. league. He turned, you know, three or four, you know, and he and he's literally sorry, he's 30. Oh, he's 32. Oh, Lord. Okay. Um, you know. And you know he he was out the league by his best. He was out the league by like 20, 20, 28. Like nothing's promised in this league. And I know he's going to be highly paid, and Philadelphia's going to do whatever it can to t- keep him on the floor. But this is terrible. Then Paul George can't stay healthy. It's like the Sixers are just a mess. The Bucks yeah. are a mess. The Sixers are even a worse mess. And even Maxi, and that's not his fault. He put but his hamstring is like. Like, damn, like, it's just, they're a mess. And that's, and B is a central part of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and there's no signs or, 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 you know, you know, exit ramps where you say, man, if they just do this, that'll make things a little bit better. They, they got to ride this out and, and hope that, that he can get right enough to help them, you know, make a little noise come playoff time. Cause then you know what happened in the regular season. I mean, they're going to, their, their goal really should be to just get to the playoffs and avoid the playing game. Uh, at this point, but if you're going to have your best player in and out of the lineup the way Joel is going to be for health and, and load management and, and all that stuff. Uh, so that that's an issue. But, you know, Joel and the Sixers are trying to figure out, you know, exactly how to navigate him, his health. And, and unfortunately, Oklahoma City is doing a little bit of that of their own with Chet Holmgren and his injury and, and how that's going to keep him out for quite a while. Uh, Gary, how do you think that's going to impact that team, you know, in both the short and long term. Short term, just being a regular mess, the rest of the regular season. Long term, obviously, is, is playoffs. Yeah. I mean, the pelvic bone, um, a very dangerous injury, and and Chet's not a big guy. And so, you know, you want to bring him back slowly in terms of just like you don't want anything happening to him. And he's a little bit frail. He's had some injuries in his career, missed his entire rookie year. Um, but Oklahoma City's going to need another big. Hardenstein's not back either. You know, so they're going to have to survive. The thing is they have all the assets to get anybody they want in there through a trade. Um, I think we'll see in the next couple of weeks how it all works out for the Thunder. They just have so much depth in the other positions, though. you think well, they'd, they'd be fine. But they're still searching for that difference-making center. I know, I know Hardenstein, I think he's probably about a few weeks out. I think he's supposed mm-hmm. to miss six weeks. Um, so he's probably maybe late, late, late. November return, early December, and you and you hope that works out for them. And then Holmgren, I think probably is going to be a couple of months on on that injury. Um, you know, you can sign. You know, there's guys like out on the street. You know, Bismack Biombo, guys like that. I'm not ripping Bismack at all, but there's free agent centers on the street. I saw uh, Dwight Howard was clamoring to, to go to Oklahoma City because he's he's right. trying to still trying to play. Uh, I don't think the Thunder will go in that direction. No. Um, however, uh, you know, you can sign, you can start signing guys. I know the 10 day contract is going to come up in the next couple of weeks too. Um, you know, you're just going to have to make do if you're the, if you're the, if you're the, if you're the thunder, uh, you know, they prepare for this, but they just, unfortunately injuries are, are part of the game and, you know, they're not a physical team. I think they can get by on being finesse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're, they're so deep uh, at, at so many different positions. You know, guys that you know that, that are just simply coming into their own right now, right before our eyes. And when you look throughout the NBA landscape, uh, and you talk and you're thinking about guys who are kind of coming in their own, Wimby comes to mind. Uh, had became the fourth youngest player in NBA history to drop 50 or more uh, the other night. And, and Gary, I mean. Yeah. This guy came in with a tremendous amount of hype, uh, the kind of hype that if you can just come close to living up to it, you've had a good career, more likely than not. Uh, it seems the more you watch him play, 
the scarier he becomes because things are starting to slow down and he's starting to do things that I think for the rest of the league uh, has got to b- bring a little bit of fear in your heart because he he's really starting to assert himself as, as a guy who's not just, you know, a really good young player, just a really good player who just so happens to be young. What, what are your impressions of Wimby and what he's been able to do so far? So far, I, I mean, I think everything is – he's – Better at everything. Um, playing a little bit, a couple of more minutes a game. His field goal percentage is up slightly. His three point shooting's up about a ha- percentage and a half, almost 2%. Um, free throw shooter, he's a better free throw shooter, 87%. Pretty impressive wow. there. Um, rebounds about the same. Assists a little down. The blocks, <laughs> 3.6 and 3.8. And he's getting a, a steal, 1.3 steal. So, and only getting two fouls a game, so he's not getting. He's not a guy prone to fouling. He, he's scoring. You know, he's only playing thirty-one minutes a game, so it's not like he's playing thirty-eight. There's a, a guy probably his age. What I know, San Antonio's bringing him off slow, um, but he's ta- he's making that jump. He's not making that dramatic jump, um, but uh, he's making that jump. And obviously, obviously a fifty-point game. Uh, you know. What can you say about about this guy? I, you know, it's just going to be a matter of time before it's his league. I think everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. He he has the right attitude. He wants to win. He plays hard. I don't think he's out there trying to jersey swap after every game and take take dude sneakers and and sign them and and all that. He's not doing that stuff. He he wants to. He's a killer, and that's a great thing for him. And I think it's just a matter of time when San Antonio builds a team around him. And they're six and six. The Spurs aren't bad. Yeah. Um, you know, they're not good, but they're not bad. They got a chance of that playing. Um, I think that's good for him to be just that that guy. And and I think he's comfortable with that role, and I think he's gonna be fine. Yeah, yeah. Wimby is certainly all that and then some uh when you think about the top players, not just top young players, but top players in general, he's been that impactful, uh, without question. Uh, well, that is it for this week's episode of. The hold Big on, hold on, no, 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 that's not it. Big game on Saturday. Big game on Saturday. Uh, the brawl for it all. Syracuse and Cal. What? Three p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific time for you uh, guys on the West Coast who, who follow us. It's the brawl for it all. Washburn against Blakely. Cal, let's go. We try to get bowl eligible, so a huge game, huge game for bragging rights for a, a whole 12 months. Look. We're in the same conference now, so let's go, Bears. Um, that's all I wanted to say. I, I know – sorry, sorry, Sherrod, y'all had to come to Boston and take an L. That's oh, that's, that's te- oh, terrible, terrible. Gary? Come on, uh, we just not here to take, take the L. Uh, but big game on Saturday – uh, we'll see what happens, but yeah, like, uh, let's go Bears. You talk about Cal like they nice. Listen, we, we, we could have been undefeated. Let's not talk about what could have been. Could have, should have, would have. If we had a capable kicker, <laughs> we'd be, we could be undefeated right now. And, and I only want to talk about that Miami game, but we're going for bowl eligibility and we got the orange. And I'm sure Syracuse will show out. I'm sure there's a lot of Q's fans on the West Coast that will come out out for that game. So it should be a great environment. I just know that y'all trying to be bowl eligible. We there. We we already checked that box off. So we're good no matter what happens. Uh Smashing y'all would be better. But we good regardless. So – Let's hope that y'all can get one more win this year so that y'all can join us among the bowl oh, eligible yeah. fraternity. <laughs> Hopefully y'all right. can join us. Yes, you're right. We, you're right. Because, Garrett, we got the velvet rope. We're on the other side of the velvet rope, and we're looking at you like, hey. <laughs> All right. We'll be in the VIP section, too. Uh, we'll get so, you, there. so y'all just stand in line, and maybe y'all get over the velvet rope and get into the club like we are. Uh, right. Maybe y'all might mm-hmm. get that this season. Ooh. Man, look at here. Golden, the cow cubbies. Man, look at here. Y'all trash. Y'all trash. And on that note, we're going to get out of here. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Big Three NBA podcast. Uh, for Gary Washburn and, and those cow cubbies, uh, we're going to catch a fat L in the crib this weekend. It's Rob Blakely, and we are out.
out.